Okay, hi. This week we're going to get into the details of how we map data to symbols or images. But we have to start with a little bit of a reminder. We're going to quickly review data measurement scales. Um, we're talking about nominal, ordinal, and quantitative numeric values. Um, bear with me. I'm going to go through this quickly. Nominal data are data that can be described, not measured. Names, labels, categories. Ordinal data, data that has a rank like low, medium, and high, first, second, and third, but we can't determine if third is twice you know, the distance as first or anything like that. And then quantitative data, quantitative data is numeric and continuous. So not numbers that represent something qualitative like land cover types, but genuine quantities, measurable quantities. Um, interval data is a kind of quantitative data. Um, let me get down to this. Okay, interval data has an arbitrary zero point. Arbitrary because zero in this case wouldn't mean none of that thing. For example, zero latitude doesn't mean there's no latitude, it's just the origin. Zero Fahrenheit doesn't mean there's no temperature, it's just the starting place for that scale. So that's interval data. Ratio data has a fixed and a very meaningful zero. Zero dollars is no money. So hopefully this is all a review for you guys. Why are these delineations important? Um, because you can't take an average of ordinal rankings, for example, and expect it to mean something. You can't take the average of a bunch of numbers that represent aspen trees versus conifer versus open water versus um, rocky hill slope. So you need to understand the type of data you have in order to know how it can be manipulated and then visualized. And I can't advance. There we go. Okay. Um, again, blowing through. So now that you've had a chance to work in Tableau a little bit, it might be helpful to talk more about dimensions and measures. Um, these are ways of describing the variables in your spreadsheets, of course. Dimensions are the independent variables. Descriptive, they're nominal or ordinal data. They're categories like countries, dates, species, or binned quantities. The measures, on the other hand, are the dependent variables, values that can be summed, averaged, counted, the numbers that you ultimately want to analyze. However, some variables can serve both. Sometimes a year is a dimension. Sometimes it's a measure. Sometimes data is formatted in such a way that Tableau reads it like a dimension, but it's really a measure. You just need to know that you um, can right click on the dimensions and measures in the left pane and convert to the other type really easily. Sometimes you'll add a spreadsheet and the whole thing will come in. All of the different measures will come in as dimensions. You can just shift click to select the whole thing, right click um, and convert to measures and it, it'll turn them all blue and move them down to the bottom. Okay, let's look at a quick example. Um, if you did the reading, you know that Tableau likes long data, not wide data. So here we have a table with populations of males and females in age groups for each year. We're only looking at uh, part of the year 1850. And obviously this data is from the 1850s because gender is binary. Okay, the year column duplicates for each group. So here you can see um, the gender, binary gender, um, we've got age group, so one for each uh, gender class, and then the year is repeated. And then we move to our second age class, we've got our binary gender, and we're repeating the year again. So we're going to keep repeating all the way down. Now you can see here there's a marriage status column. So as we, um, we probably don't have this information here, but as we get further down and we start getting into ages of people that are getting married, um, then we're going to have to start duplicating the years even more to break it down. So we're going to have 25 year olds that are male that are married, that are unmarried, divorced, widowed, and we're going to have a new row for each one of those things. The people count here is our continuous data. This is our measure. Okay, so this is pivoted data um, because it's long and we're duplicating um, dimensions um, and spreading it down, if that makes sense. So let's think about the type of data that these represent. 
We know that that population count are the quantities we ultimately would want to analyze, like summing, averaging, detecting change over time. So that's definitely a measure. Uh, gender is nominal data. Marital status, nominal. They're just categories. Um, age is quantitative. It's uh, ratio data, but it could be treated as a category because it's a bin, right? Same with year. Uh, wait, ratio data, it's an interval. I think I said that wrong. Because um, it's got a meaningful zero. Um, same with year, it's a number, uh, it's quantitative interval this time because the year zero doesn't mean there wasn't a year that year. Well, maybe I do have them switched. You guys don't listen to me. <laughs> All right, let's just move on. <laughs> so year and age could be either dimensions or measures. That's still true. The ages are numbers and could be treated as measures or they could be treated as bins, which would make them dimensions. That's still true. Uh, and then the marital status and gender are gonna be dimensions, period. Okay, so here are some examples of using color or hue to encode quantitative, ordinal, and nominal data. So this heat map is quantitative data, right? Um, it's showing the annual distribution of birthdays, how likely um, there is to be a birthday on any given month and day of the year. Um, the color gives us an overall sense for what parts of the year and dates birthdays are more common, but it's just based on a number, a continuous number that could be a probability or a percentage or something like that. Um, yeah, so late summer birthdays, more common. Interesting little dark patch down here, huh, near the end of December. I wonder if people are shooting for first baby of the year and just missed the mark. And this is also kind of a light one. I mean, an interesting kind of anomaly to the summer months. Um, anyway, so what do we know about encoding values with color? It's very unlikely that humans are going to be able to detect specific differences between the color shades in order to extract accurate numeric values, but that's why the legend is very general, like more common, less common. The goal isn't to convey the probability of having a birthday on May 17th, it's to show the annual distribution likelihood, kind of how it changes over the course of the year. Oh, I can see that my animations worked out really well. Um, okay, so in the upper right now, uh, green, yellow, and orange to signify low, medium, and high groupings. Ordinal data, kind of your classic stoplight um, colors. Uh, and then here, categorical or nominal data. It's random, so there's no implied rank, but the color is used to simplify the message by um, representing the actual color being described. So new car colors in 2012. So white represents white, so we don't have to have um, any kind of a legend, which makes perfect sense. Okay, so here's a challenge, a challenge evaluation. Um, what we're looking at here, and I do want you to take a minute to read it, it's a stacked histogram. We haven't looked at these before. Car manufacturer is on the horizontal x-axis, like um, Audi, Chevrolet, Dodge, Ford, etc., and then frequency is on the vertical or uh, y-axis. And what we're looking at the frequency of is um, the type of vehicle manufactured by each manufacturer. So two-seaters, compact, mid-size, minivans, pickups, subcompacts, and SUVs. Completely fictional data. I mean, they're showing that Volkswagen only makes SUVs. Um, yeah, anyway. But the idea is... Um, you know, how does this work for you? How easy is this for you to read? What's the easiest thing for you to take away from this plot? So we're encoding the type of vehicle with color, the overall production in length or position against the common scale, right? So to me, that's the easiest thing to decode, is which manufacturer is producing the most vehicles, even though it's completely fictional. And then I would argue that it's easiest to look at the individual manufacturers and get a sense of what they're producing relative to themselves. You know, the chart claims that Chevrolet produces mostly compact cars. But, you know, you can look at any given and then hop over here and, and use this um, strangely rainbow 
um, legend to compare. I do think it's harder to ask like which manufacturer is producing the most subcompact vehicles. That's this um, kind of teal color. You have to search the chart for teal blue and then compare lengths that don't share a common origin or baseline. And I think that's a little bit trickier. Okay, another, another um, opportunity to practice a little bit. This is William Playfair's um, time series plot. Remember, he was the first person to create both bar charts and time series plots uh, a long time ago. Uh, this is quite famous, in fact. Um, it shows the trade balance between England and Denmark and Norway. So let's look at what kind of information is being encoded here. It's deconstructed. Um, time is being encoded on the horizontal axis. Oopsies. So time down here. Quantities or dollar amounts of the trades are encoded on the vertical or y-axis. I'm not sure if this is dollars or numbers. It doesn't really matter. Um, it's the change in that over time. Okay, so color is used to encode whether the trade is an import or an export. It might be a little bit hard to see, but the lines are colored orange and red. Um, orange is the level of imports. That's this guy here. And reds are the levels of exports. And then the area filled in represents the trade balance or the trade imbalance. Yellow is where England is exporting more than importing, and orange is where England was importing more than exporting. So somewhere in the mid-1750s, England's trade balance shifted in favor of England. I mean, I know that lumber and timber was a big uh, trade back then. I'm not sure what, what happened here, but I'm definitely curious. Okay, this is Charles Menard's uh, 1869 chart showing the number of soldiers in Napoleon's march on Russia in 1812. We uh, looked at this at the beginning of the semester. So let's look at what's being encoded here. This thing is brilliant. Okay, first notice there's two panels. In the upper panel, Menard uh, employs an X and a Y axis to denote latitude and longitude. So this is basically a map. We're looking at it in plan form. Notice that there's a scale bar and geographic context like rivers and city labels. Okay, and then color is being used to encode whether the army is advancing in tan or retreating in black. And then the width of the line is encoding the size of the remaining army. And there's numbers in here too, if you um, wanna look this up. So this is where they started. They marched, and then they started their retreat. They were joined back up here, so they had a little boom in population, and then dwindled to almost nothing. Okay, the bottom panel also has an X and a Y axis, but this time we're looking in profile, not plan form. The X axis here is a dual axis. It's encoding both longitude, so position along the map, tracking along there, and time. And then the y-axis is encoding temperature, the temperature that they encountered on their return path. It was really cold. These are negative temperatures. This is considered one of the greatest data visualizations of all time. <laughs> I just watched Napoleon Dynamite last night, so of course, Kip's voice just popped in my head. Napoleon, you can't even possibly know that. <laughs> anyway. That isn't what he said. I'm being corrected by many of you right now, I'm sure. I deserve it. Okay, uh, what's next here? Uh, excess temperature, human time, right. So we've talked a lot about some basic rules, things that work well, things you should do. Sometimes it's um, very simplifying to state what you can't do, like starting the range of values on a bar chart at anything other than zero. Don't do that. Here's a chart showing car models on the vertical, the y-axis, and the country the car is manufactured in on the X, this is really wrong. So the length of the bar here implies that there's some kind of quality or quantity about the country that is implying some kind of rank. I mean, are Swedish cars the best? Do they make the most of them? Um, you know, what does that actually mean? So it doesn't make any sense to use a bar chart 
for something like this. And so I think my challenge to you is what are some of the options for encoding and visualizing this data? We're working with model of car and the country of origin. What would make sense here? Hmm, that would make a really good quiz question. Bum, bum, bum. All right, so choosing visual encodings. There is this thing called the principle of consistency, meaning that the properties of the image, the visual variables, should match the properties of the data. Don't use a bar chart to measure something quantitative. I said that exactly opposite. Don't use a bar chart to uh, display or visualize something qualitative or categorical. Okay, so don't use position along a scale and imply a rank if there is no rank. And then the other thing is the principle of importance ordering. And sometimes I think these things just have names to make us all go crazy. Like what's different? What's the difference between the principle of importance ordering and the effectiveness principle? Nothing. The important thing is to encode your most important information, your message in the most effective way possible. So I just like to say things a thousand different ways. Okay, in other words, tell the truth and nothing but the truth. Again, don't use bar charts for categorical data. Uh, don't lie and don't lie by leaving things out. And use encodings that people decode faster and more accurately. And we're going to talk about that in the next set of slides.